So welcome everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on where we're meeting today, even virtually, the Turrbal and the Agora people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and recognise that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play uh, an important role at QUT and throughout the community, and we celebrate that these lands have always been a place of learning and research. It is wonderful to have the opportunity to host Dr. Kathy Foley for this STEM Summit. The summit has a theme around the importance of science as being critical for Australia's future. These past two years have shown how important our collective scientific expertise has been, both to solve global challenges and explaining difficult concepts. Kathy Foley is someone who throughout her career as a scientist also combined leadership roles in institutions and in agencies aimed at advancing science. Kathy has a long career in solid state physics and material science, in particular focusing on superconducting materials. She has undertaken both fundamental science and been involved in developing and commercialising her research. Together with colleagues at CSIRO, she developed a sensor system which has gone on to be used to detect ore deposits up to $6 billion in value, so that's not a bad project. In 2020, she was made a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and also in the same year appointed an officer in the Order of Australia for her distinguished service to research, science and to the advancement of women in physics and to professional scientific organisations. She has received many other awards. She commenced her uh, role as Australia's ninth chief scientist earlier this year, and she was appointed to that after a lengthy career at Australia's National Science Agency, the CSIRO, where her last role was as the agency's chief scientist, a role she took on in, in 2018. She joins us today to shed light on how science benefits all of Australia and how she uses science to inform po policy. So please welcome Kathy Foley. Thank you. Oh, hi everyone. It's great to be here, and thanks for that lovely invita invitation to talk today to you today from Margaret. So thank you. I um, am speaking from the traditional lands of the Kamaragal people up in northern part of Sydney, just near the Karingai National Park. I want to pay my respects to uh, them and traditional custodians of the lands where you are today. I want to acknowledge the elders who are caring for those lands and pay my respects to the old ones who've come before, but also the young ones who will follow. And today, I thought it'd be great to be able to share my life lessons from a STEM journey of my career. So as Australia's Chief Scientist, it's been an amazing opportunity for me to go from being someone at school all the way through to being Australia's Chief Science Advisor to Government. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of an introduction to my career. And I'll start off by saying when I was at school, I always loved science and maths. I have to acknowledge that because I was actually really terrible at everything else. I am not good at spelling still, but thank goodness for spell checker. And also I'm a bit dyslexic, but maths and science was my thing. I just love to think about the world around me. Also, I, I came from a Catholic background, which was reasonably privileged, middle class. My parents are educated and I never wanted for anything. I uh, therefore had this thing put into my life of saying that when you have privilege, you also need to give back. And so I was brought up with this idea I wanted to save the world and make a difference in some way. So at the end of high school, I actually went up and worked with Indigenous people in Burke. And this was a long time ago in 1975, shows me I'm getting a bit old. And it was my way of looking at addressing injustice and trying to see how I can improve things. And you can see a photo there of me uh, running a little preschool for us some months there. But while I was there, I actually had um, a realisation which was a really important thing for me. And that was that I wanted to make a bigger impact, not just the one-to-one, -one, which is really important, but I wanted to change the system. And so when I was back at school, though, in high school, we actually had quite limited career options back there. So, for example, if uh, girls were thought of as either being um, a teacher or a secretary, a uh, nurse, um, a hairdresser, and, of course, coming from a Catholic background, a nun, but not all those options, they're not bad options, but they are quite limited. 
And none of them were actually going to change the system the way I wanted because they only helped a few people at a time. And so when I went to university, I was going to be a high school science teacher, but I discovered science and the pathway to science as a research opportunity and becoming a researcher or a scientist. So what I did was instead of um, being a school teacher, although I did train to be a school teacher, I actually went on and did graduate work and uh, in this area of physics because it was something which I just wanted to know how absolutely everything fundamental worked. But then I was able to take that, be uh, able to understand particularly solid materials um, and make devices that can detect very small magnetic fields, so small like the ones that come from your brain or your heart, and be able to turn that into an instrument that could be used for detecting minerals from the air. So this is a picture here of some of the things I've done. You can see me sitting on a tarmac there doing some measurements with our, our system, our sensor system to be looking for minerals from the air. Through to, you can see me wearing a, what looks like um, a, a, a space suit or something where we made those devices in a clean room. And also because science needs to be known by everyone, I had the great opportunity to be able to uh, give talks to the media. So doing radio interviews and to the newspapers and I've had a most amazing career. But importantly, I could do that and also raise a family, which in contrast to the 50s and 60s, when women couldn't work and be married or have children, I felt like I've come, uh, been part of something that's come a long way. But I have to say, it wasn't always smooth sailing because even when I had children, they're now in their early 30s, I had to rally around with my colleagues to uh, build a childcare centre because back then they didn't even exist. But what I uh, faced then is quite different to the world that you're going to be facing because it's really changing fast. And the future of science, technology, engineering and maths or STEM is much broader than ever before. And things are coming along which are in the realm of science fiction, but they're actually here and, can, and are happening now. And that means that the careers you could be having uh, are in fields you don't even know exist yet. And here's some examples. Future industries are on the horizon and are being built now. And they include things such as hydrogen, which is uh, going to allow us to ship our sunshine overseas as new, clean, renewable fuel. Or in space, and often we think of space as being just astronauts, but in fact, there's a whole range of different um, roles that are needed there, which are very few are actually astronauts. And we've got the Australian Space Agency aiming to triple the size of the Australian workforce by 2030. In fact, they want to have 20,000 people working on, in space or on space industries. And then artificial intelligence and machine learning is already huge. In fact, by 2024, which is only three years away, we're expecting to need to fill 250,000 jobs. So that means that we need to have a, a technical um, digital workforce that will be bigger than any other part of the sector in the working sector in Australia. And then another area, which is my own personal interest, is quantum. This is a huge potential for an emerging quantum technology industry. And this is here now. It's just to let you know what it is. It's the ability to get hold of electrons and photons, which are quantum particles, and we can isolate them, control them, and do things with them that allows us to, uh, well, originally the first quantum revolution was lasers and transistors. But they're going to see future things which are like quantum computers. And that's going to take us to a whole new regime. We think that 16,000 jobs are going to be created in the quantum area. And already there are so many jobs there that people can't, they can't be filled. And so that's a real area for you to look forward to. But it's not just science on its own. It's what I call science plus that actually is needed because science is just one bit of it. When we have a science discovery and we want to turn it into something that has impact, we need to turn that science into an engineered outcome or product that needs the design and user interface. So that means the, um, the arts and humanities are really important. We need to have the right business models so that we make sure that we're able to set it up so people will buy it. And that requires economists and, and marketing people and business people. We need government's policy and regulation, the social license so that we accept that it's something we want 
and as a society we will use and, and think is a good thing, but also that whole business of making it work together. So we need entrepreneurs and people who will be marketing things so that we're aware of this. It's when all these parts come together, talk to each other all the time, that we see a really rich opportunity for our, our nation and for you, for your careers. So your STEM careers may in one of, those, one of those areas as well. So it's not just about the science. So let's give an example from June this year of a new process that's being developed to recycle plastic into vanilla flavoring, and it's using genetically engineered bacteria. So I've taken a quick guess at some of the different roles that could be involved here, just to make this come to market. So you can see there, there's an engineer to design the recycling plant or organic chemist and biochemist to develop the process. And as I mentioned, we need the marketing and communication team to say, will people eat it? And of course, the commercialization team and the chemical engineer to see if we can take it from the laboratory bench into a factory and scale it. So what might your STEM career look like? Well, your STEM career might be something where you're a roller coaster engineer or a music machine engineer that learns uh, how to, for say Spotify, know what to recommend next for you to listen to. Or they're the storm trackers who are able to let us know what the weather's gonna be like tomorrow. Or ethical hackers, people who actually practice breaking into your computer in order to make sure we understand where the weaknesses are so we can mitigate for that. Or the fragrance chemists and cosmetic scientists. Did you know that L'Oreal is the biggest patent owner of nanotechnologies in the world? So they have huge numbers of scientists working in cosmetics. We've also got aquarists who are looking after our aquariums or urban farmers, scientific illustrators, or pyrotechnicians who are able to create fireworks. All these careers actually require us to have STEM capabilities in our toolkit. So many of the jobs that you'll end up with actually don't exist yet, but some of the jobs that exist now actually may not exist in the future. So take a look at this transformation in telecommunications where from you know, several decades ago, people were operating telephone lines or, um, manually. And now, of course, it's re reduced to the automation, which is based by cables and masses of them, as you can see here. So in short, things are changing rapidly. And if I could give you a comprehensive list of every single STEM career possibility right now, it would be out of date by the time you hit university, let alone by the time you graduate. So this is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. I often hear from students that they want to study medicine because they think it will help people. And that's fantastic. In fact, my daughter's a, a doctor, medical doctor. But I also hear that students want to help people. And so they think they have to go into medicine to do that. But I really want to plead with you to understand that every STEM discipline opens up huge opportunities to better the whole world around us, whether it's artificial intelligence and IT, whether it's pure maths or chemistry, biology, social science and physics. So what I'm saying here is that you need to follow your interests and your inclinations because there is no best pathway and the world is your oyster regardless of where you want to work and where your interests lie. So how do you get there? As you head into your senior subjects choices and thinking about what you might wanna do when you finish school, such as in TAFE or at university, it's easy to feel that you're choosing one pathway that's forcing you to abandon all others. And there's only one end position to aim for. But that's so far from the truth. And I'm wanting you to think about how you can keep your options open, keep your eyes open, because at each step, it actually opens up a huge array of new options over and over again. And what we've also seen is because of this, there are actually new ways of working and that you're perfectly placed to surf the wave of change as we've seen happen in the last few years. Because what have we seen? We've seen COVID and we've seen digitization as a consequence of that, and it's happened really fast. Uh, we've got great, great connectivity and automation. And with that, it's created new ways of working. 
And that means with new ways of working, there are new opportunities. And so you're going to need to be flexible and be prepared because there's so many more things that are out there which we don't even know about yet and for you to go looking for. And it's hard to picture that there are many, many options available to you. But here's a few things that might help you visualise what you don't know about. And I've listed them there and I hope that you'll go looking for them. So what are my takeaways today? STEM is a great career and I've had the most amazing one, starting from being someone who's terrible at spelling in primary school, all the way through to high school, university, going and working at CSIRO for a long time and then finally being this role of Australia's chief scientist. You can have that career too. And it can also allow you to have work-life balance like I've had. So I've had children and marriage and a happy life as well. And you can keep your options open because there are many more jobs than you know about. And there are lots of ways to save the world. It's not just through the narrow pathway of helping people one-to-one. -one. So thank you for the chance to tell you today about my ideas of where the options are for careers in STEM. And I'm looking forward to talking to you soon with uh, Margaret and answering your questions. So thank you very much for that. Cathy, now just to turn to some questions. Uh, the first one is the future isn't a fixed destination. So what advice would you give the summit students to help them prepare for a dynamic rather than a static future in STEM? Oh, thanks. Uh, Margaret, that's a really important question because, as you know, it's not as though we know what the world's going to look like. We've got ideas that we have to transition from the sort of world we have now to one which is dealing with low emission technologies and a whole range of things from environmental management, uh, trying to make sure we're able to feed the world. So that means that there's going to be a whole range of new jobs which we don't know about yet. But the way to manage that is to make sure that we don't just think of finishing university, finishing school, finishing our TAFE courses and thinking that's it. We're going to have lifelong learning. And I think we all know that we're constantly having to learn new things. I still am now. And there's so many different ways to learn stuff from teaching yourself through going on the internet and watching YouTube videos and lectures, or even um, just going through and uh, doing um, a, a continuing education course or um, all these micro-credentialing that's coming on. So I think if, every, if anything, if you start off though by keeping your options open, learning things which are transferable skills that can be used not just in one narrow area, but recognising they can be used in a range of different areas. And you can then skill up um, and tighten up the requirements as, as the opportunities arrive. And the whole thing of skills development will change and evolve over a uh, over career, which I know you and I probably have experienced as well. We certainly have. I know. Um, so thank you for that. I, I, when I think about the various... Um, turns that my career's uh, taken. But also, have you seen a cultural shift in the last 10 years on the barriers to STEM education, you know, understanding, reception, encouragement in the uptake of STEM um, in careers and in employment? Yeah, the uptake of STEM careers and employment, I think is in a process of shifting a lot in multiple ways. I know when I went to university, uh, the idea was that you might do a science degree or a STEM degree, and then you'd be only thinking about working in a laboratory or in a university or an academic environment. I, I worked for CSIRO for 36 years before I got this job. And, uh, and uh, it was quite a narrow idea of where the opportunities are. But I think what we're seeing now is a richness where STEM education is needed in, or STEM educated skilled people are needed in government, in the public service, in a whole range of industries, and we don't have anywhere near enough people there, and there's a real skills shortage. Uh, then we also have the ability to also work in laboratories and, and that sort of thing. So I think what we're seeing too, though, is not just people applying for jobs, but we're now beginning to see people creating their own jobs. And I think that, for me, is really exciting. And I wonder what what my future, my, what my trajectory would have been like into the future if I was just finishing school now. Because I, I'm actually quite entrepreneurial. I like the idea of creating my own business. And I think we're seeing that more and more where people come up with ideas or they've invented something or some, their own research and then they want to take it out and commercialise it for themselves and start their own business. So that's something which I think is a real change and a shift 
And I hope we'll see more of it because it's a wonderful opportunity and we're seeing a real explosion of that. I know you must see that um, where you are as well in your university. So one, two, three. And yes, thank you, Kathy. And we certainly have a, a great interest in entrepreneurship here amongst our, our young students and we have a range of programs for that. And, you know, reflecting on my introduction where you were able to combine your career at CSIRO with a very successful commercial application in and at another time, you might have gone out and run that company and, and then come back to CSIRO or elsewhere. So we do need young people who are adaptable, creative, able to think critically, uh, and that can use their initiative to collaborate with others and to develop solutions um, to build that future for themselves and for others. So what do you think your role now as the chief scientist play, plays in ensuring we have that kind of diverse thinking in our, our STEM workforce of the future? Actually, it's pretty exciting being Australia's chief scientist, I have to say, because it gives me a great opportunity to, I guess, have influence. I don't actually hold the levers and pull them to make decisions or policy. My role is to provide you know, best possible advice to government. And, um, and also to see how I can be an advocate for um, Australian science here and overseas, and also to see how I can help the system be effective, efficient, and impactful as possible. And so I guess my part of that then is my role is to make sure that we understand where STEM is needed and where, the government, in the case of government, they recognise that this is the pathway in order to achieve um, what's needed by our society. And, I've got uh, something here which is really exciting from the Prime Minister. When I was appointed, he said that, that one of the reasons I was selected was because it's a pivotal time in history with the uh, recovery of COVID, we want to rebuild a, future, a bright future, and uh, that role of the Chief Scientist is never more important because of the need to have government um, being able to use science and technology to navigate its way into a bright future for Australia. And I think that's... I, I think says it all, is that my role is to make sure that the opportunities are made, um, are, are recognised, that uh, we look at from the whole range from vaccines to uh, low emission technologies through to future manufacturing, quantum industries and so on, are all things that require some STEM involvement and uh, making sure that we understand at school, realise uh, when you're at school that there's actually a clear career pathway to not just a narrow one where you're white, you know, white, white coat laboratory person, but there's a whole, a whole range of different uh, areas and different pathways. And I'm hoping that part of my role will be to make those pathways really clear so that anyone in school now can say, you know, at the moment I know what a doctor and a lawyer does, but I'm actually not really sure what a scientist or an engineer does. And I hope that that will change. And so that's one of the things I'm working on. Kathy, that's terrific. And it's such an exciting role in, in many ways as as you explain, you get the opportunity to see the best of Australian science and international science. So my last question is quite a tricky one. Uh, it, I'm glad you're answering it, not me, that imagining the next 50 years of science and technology, what do you think the big next generation of discoveries might be in the decades to come? So uh, good one. In 50 years. So if we think about when we've made big discoveries, it's usually because we're able to either um, understand data better. So I think quantum computing will come along and it will open up a whole range of us to be able to analyse information we couldn't do before. Uh, at the moment, we think with even supercomputers, we can uh, solve problems like climate change or, um, or manage big um, databases from all the information that comes from radio telescopes as just two examples. But that they're still very limited and uh, the quantum computers are going to actually open up the ability to do absolutely huge very um, uh, calculations using a whole lot of different variables, which you just can't do now. So I think that's going to open up a whole lot of discoveries. I think um, things in my own area, I, I reckon in 50 years time, we'll work out how to make a room temperature superconductor, which allows electricity to flow without the loss of, electricity, uh, loss of energy. Um, I suspect, in fact, there's a challenge on at the moment from uh, my counterpart in the USA saying, can we get to a point where we can respond to a, um, a pandemic in 100 days so that we actually are able to understand what it is, develop a vaccine and roll it out so the world is vaccinated in 100 days? 
uh, so that we don't have to go through a pandemic like this again, because they will happen. It's, it's, it's inevitable. So can we actually do better? So just the thought of trying to achieve that in itself in 100 days is remarkable. We're, I thought it was remarkable that we responded at the rate we have already with the current COVID pandemic. And, um, and I guess the other is we're building a square kilometre array, uh, which Australia is part of, at that in South Africa. This is going to be the biggest telescope ever, radio telescope ever made. And I think it's going to open up so much information about how the universe works. And the thing that's interesting is when we do that, we're going to actually um, find out um, more about not just um, the universe, but actually more about ourselves and more about what you know how we operate in new physics, I guess. And I guess my final one, as you can see, I've got lots of ideas what might happen, is we still don't know how the brain works. You know, it's our brains are amazing things that there's sort of what a kilogram or two in mushy stuff. And yet the computations we can do, the parallel thinking, we still don't know how they how that works, how we have um, the connection between emotions and you know just the the molecules moving around and the currents that we have. I actually think there's going to be a strong what I call quantum biology, which is actually using not classical physics but quantum physics to actually understand those sorts of biological processes. Same as with photosynthesis, we still don't really understand photosynthesis. And yet that's a really basic thing which we absolutely rely on to feed ourselves and to generate um, you know, carbon dioxide into oxygen. So there's so much that we don't know and we're getting so much better at designing experiments, pushing the boundaries of new equipment, engineering things. So you know, things like big science experiments like particle accelerators at CERN led to us having the internet. So who would have thought that looking for, you know, sort of breaking up subatomic particles and finding the God particle, the Higgs boson, would lead to us actually having internet. Or um, radio astronomy in Australia developed Wi-Fi. You know, so these are sorts of things which are spin-outs from um, these big experiments. And you never know where they are, but I think as humans we have to keep pushing those boundaries. And that's, I guess, why science is so amazing. Kathy, thank you so much. Um, that's been a terrific uh, end to, to the uh, presentation and, and, and the questions. And thank you for taking time out of your really busy schedule to talk to our future scientists. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Margaret. It's been great to be here. I hope the whole event goes well.